Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming after this tough party and tough morning. I hope I will not disappoint you. I will try to not make you fall asleep. Uh, therefore, first couple of words, uh, how will we do this today? Uh, so I have a 40 minute slot basically, and uh, I do not want you to wait till the end of the talk to ask questions. Please uh, raise your hand uh, at any point of time. We'll try to make this interactive. So of course I have the microphone, so I'm the boss now, but you'll get one too. Just raise your hands. We have a nice discussion here. So. I talked to you today about the asynchronous web development and Tornado. In particular, how can we make it better with tools that come with Python 3? First of all, of course, you have the question, who is this guy and what does he know to present such stuff? So I'm just as you, just a Python developer. And uh, I work with Python for like five years, more or less. I love it. I love it so much that uh, I started the PyMunich group that is uh, making workshops in Munich and we are trying to get more people into Python. I love it so much that, of course, I work with a company that is very Python friendly. I'll say a couple of words about that too. My company, uh, Scooby, is a German ebook subscription service. It offers uh, lots of uh, ebooks on the monthly subscription base, like a flat rate. Uh, we have the native apps for Android and iOS, and uh, people like that apps because they put five star ratings to them, even though it costs money, which is pretty cool. Of course, being user-friendly is nice, but it's more important to be developer-friendly. So the stuff that I'm going to present you today is not some uh, abstract blog post that I read a week ago. This is stuff that runs in production for us for years. So real thing. And basically, uh, it comes out of the problems that we had. Uh, so I'm presenting you the solutions that are already deployed there. And uh, as I said, the company runs Python as a main language. We also... Uh, uh, like very much to uh, participate in Python events, share our knowledges. We are sponsoring EuroPython and also other Python events in Germany, especially. And let's move to the challenges that we have uh, from one day to another uh, that uh, lead us to these solutions. So first, we have a very distributed system, meaning that uh, we have not just one server, we have many services that need to communicate over the network, over some APIs mostly HTTP APIs. So we learned by time that uh, doing that asynchronously obviously makes it way more efficient. Therefore, we could not use just nice and fancy Django uh, because uh, internally that would be not very performance. We are trying to build tools that speak uh, to each other asynchronously and efficiently. We also on our way to migrate into Python 3, like probably most of you guys. Uh, of course, it's not that easy, but some models run Python 3, some models still run Python 2, most of them actually, of course. Uh, so it's also a bit of a challenge, uh, and we see what tools are already usable with Python 3, what tools are not. We love to share, and this presentation will be basically fully practice-based. This is the overview. Uh, first, I'll speak to you guys again, why do we need the synchronous stuff at all, and when do we need it? Uh, second, uh, how generator delegation syntax introduced in Python 3 makes it easier and nicer. Uh, then, of course, AsyncIO. This is a tool that we heard already on this conference, wonderful talks, by the way. I'm going to just quickly cover it again in case someone is still missing this information. Then Tornado, which is a real framework that can, that can be usable together with AsyncIO already at this point of time. Major thing, ready for production. And I'll show you guys a little demo of not just Tornado, of also other frameworks. How do they perform asynchronously uh, together? Uh, what issues do they have comparing to each other? Yep. Well, I want this to be on the recording, so it doesn't matter much, but okay. Good, so uh, why do we need the synchronous uh, uh, communication at all? Let's have a little recap of the web server execution models, like uh, how, uh, how, the, how can it work? The first originally idea was to have one thread per connection, right? This is very straightforward. We have a client coming in, we create a thread for it, we handle request on this thread. It's very easy, very straight, it's very easy to share the memory. We have an issue, obviously. 
Uh, okay, guys, who have seen the threaded web server dying? Anyone? Okay, yeah, so this is not just me, which is good. Uh, threaded web server runs in obvious issues when uh, operating system goes out of the memory first, can uh, do evil things to you, and uh, the worst is that uh, when our system is overloaded, not only the new clients will uh, experience uh, bad service, but also existing ones. So the whole thing crashes. Total disaster. So what would be the logical step uh, to fix this issue? Well, it would obviously be to have a pool of, on the threaded server that would limit the amount of threads or processes, doesn't really matter in this case. So by limiting the, uh, the thread pool, we will not uh, um, push our system into the state where it crashes, right? So we have a fixed number of threads when our system works fine, when it's still performant and nobody uh, experiences any problems with it. But for some new clients that will join when our pool is already packed, they will just have to wait. And this is bad because obviously uh, even if the thread pool is packed, that does not mean that our system is already out of resources. It just means that some numbers that we picked is reached, but we might and we usually do have more resources to uh, handle more clients. So the next step was to have the asynchronous web server that has just one thread, but it kind of turns the picture around, turns it a bit upside down, because this one thread has IO loop, and this IO loop controls what client is uh, getting service at which point of time, and since uh, Usually our web server are I.O. bound, so we are not performing any heavy computation in our web applications, most likely. So our CPU is pretty okay, our memory is also pretty fine. We are waiting for something. We're waiting for the database, we're waiting for cache, we're waiting for whatever thing. And so the I.O. loop can actually decide at which point of time which client can get service and other client can just wait for uh, data to be available on a particular socket, and I loop can jungle this connection, jungle the client, and just uh, yeah, process every client at the right point of time. So it does the event-driven switching in one thread. But you say, of course, async is not something new. Like, uh, th this is not the first time, of course, uh, this idea comes and rises up again. So you're right, because Tornado is like six years old, and there is also Twisted, the true Python tool for the network. I, I still think it's one of the best. And there are also stuff in other languages, obviously. Why we still use blocking servers then? What's the problem? Because sequential code is obviously way easier to read. It's easier to test. It's easier to maintain and extend. We have seen how Django was successful, how Ruby on Rails was successful, just because of the simplicity and nice batteries, of course. So these things do matter. And then, obviously, we think, why can't we just have a asynchronous code to be structured and written in the way that it can be just readable as synchronous code? Look similar without this callback hell and stuff. And Python 3 let, lets us do that. This is something that I'm going to present you today. This is just a little teaser. Obviously, you're most likely already seen it, but still. This yield from is a generator uh, subdelegation syntax introduced in Python 3, and uh, it lets us write a synchronous code in a synchronous fashion. Again, I'll have this more detailed a bit later. So now, <laughs> yield from. It aims to replace callbacks, but first we need to come to decision what's so bad about the callbacks. Like, it's something pretty common. It's uh, in Twisted since ages in JavaScript, of course. It's difficult to make it look nice. Uh, does any one of you guys work with JavaScript? Yeah, obviously, obviously. OK, so did you guys see this? <laughs> I also do JavaScript, and they see it. This is the real code besides. It's some testing thing, of course, but still, I mean, even for testing. Uh, I usually try to avoid this. And by the way, this is a nice resource, callbackhell.com. So if there is such domain registered, I assume that we are clear that we might want to avoid callbacks. So sequential code obviously looks nicer. And uh, by introducing yield from in Python 3, we have this attempt to write asynchronous codes on everyday basis without callback hell. 
Now it's time for a good example. So we have a very simple function. Let's say it's a get handler of whatever web framework. Uh, we have a huge database query that is blocking, obviously. The result of that query is saved to the result variable, and then we write this stuff back to the user. This is blocking, right? How would we do it with callbacks? So with callbacks, we can define a function, uh, just nested or anywhere, that will be a callback, that will be passed as an argument to the huge database query, and the huge database query will call it when the result is ready. Also pretty clear, right? This is not as bad as an example with JavaScript, of course, because at least it's not defined in line. But still, we can make it even better with a subgenerator-based handler. So we put yield from just before the huge database query. Um, who of you guys use this thing I already? So that, okay, so that I know. I stop a bit on this then. So what exactly does yield from do here? So huge database query in this example should not return the result, so it should not block. It should return a future. This is a magic object, I'll speak about it uh, in a moment, but this magic object is uh, like a promise that uh, the real result will come at the later point. And we yield this future back to our coroutine, to our IO loop, that will at this point switch to any other task that it has, and whenever the result of the future is ready, whenever future can be evaluated to the result, it will push it back to this point as if you can imagine as yield from would never be there. Magic. It will be saved to result and written back to the client. So uh, what is exactly this magic behind it and what AsyncIO does for this? So as it was already told a lot on this conference, uh, it, this is uh, mostly the event loop and a set of tools to use this event loop efficiently. Event loop can register a callback for any particular, uh, uh, any particular event. Let's say, most typical case, of course, we want to get to fetch some network resource, so we need to make the TCP connection, and then we just wait. So we tell IO loop, hey, IO loop, when the data will be ready on this socket, please call this function, and it does it. That's, in a glance, what, what do we need to know about it. In this example, I have a minimal setup. Uh, how can we call it? So we have a callback function, hello Euro Python. It doesn't fetch anything. It will just be called as soon as possible. Uh, first, we need to get the events loop instance. Then we schedule the callback by call soon. Call soon is call at any point of time when you can. And then we start the IO loop. That's a minimal example. So no fetching on the socket, nothing. Now to get more familiar with this thing, uh, let's talk a bit about the future object. What exactly does it do? So uh, those of you at least who worked with JavaScript probably know the uh, deferred or promise objects, most likely. So this is a very similar thing. So this is some object that uh, packs a reference to the result. We have this object just to track the state of the of the operations that we want to perform. Let's say we want to fetch a database uh, query. Uh, we call that query and the future object is just uh, returned to keep a reference to the result that is not ready yet, but will be ready at some point of time, or it will fail. So we have the future to keep the reference to something that will be available at later points of time. So simplest way to run a future is uh, just to uh, uh, use this run until complete on the IO loop and print the future result. But this is usually, of course, not the case that we want. We want it nice, asynchronous. So uh, then we need uh, to have a better syntax. We can also yield it, like here. So we define a coroutine. It's also important to mark that uh, whatever web framework you're using, it has to know that you're using coroutines. Otherwise, it, it's just a generator. So we are fetching, for example, Google.com. The result will be a future. Then we yield this future. IO loop does the fetching and uh, saves the result back to the result variable. Then we print it. And of course, to make this whole thing run, we need to run the IO loop. So what about Tornado here? Uh, Tornado is a web framework that is already there for six years. It has its own IO loop. It has its own futures. 
but now it has to be obviously compatible with AsyncIO because this is a common uh, framework that all of the Python uh, higher level libraries should use. So Tornado is already production uh, ready framework and uh, its compatibility with AsyncIO is already there. Basically this is a stack how in the best case in the future uh, we will see it in the Python world. On the application framework level we can have Tornado, Twisted or whatever other framework. Then as an IO loop, AsyncIO should be used. And finally, AsyncIO is at the end just a common interface for the operating system specific selectors like KQ, EPOL, or Windows Select, whatever. This is how should it be. Right now, even if you use Python 2, you can use uh, Tornado with a known event loop, with own features, with own everything. But since we want to develop for the future, we want to be future compatible, we can use AsyncIO as well. So let's look at the event loop. How does it work with Tornado and its compatibility with the SyncIO? Uh, this is first the way that you would get the event loop in Tornado. You just select IO loop current. It's a singleton, and you start it. This is the way that you can use Tornado with a SyncIO event loop. Basically, again, this is the same two lines of code with just different syntax. Pretty easy. Replace one with another, you're running it on a SyncIO. Futures, again, Tornado has own futures, I think IO has own futures, but they are super similar. We also have concurrent futures back from Python 2, also a pretty similar thing. But for this compatibility, we need to use the Tornado magic method that will convert one type of future into another type of future, which is not a big deal because, again, it's just one line of code. Now I think it's a good time that we have a full uh, get handler written in Tornado. Uh, let's look at this. So in Tornado, uh, we need to inherit from the request handler. We need to mark the uh, method as a coroutine so that Tornado knows that the thing that we will be yielding is the future and this future should be evaluated and then the result should be passed back. We need to instantiate the asynchronous HTTP client that will not just block, instead it will return futures. Construct them and return it for us. Then we use the fetch methods to fetch some really slow uh, API, whatever. We are yielding the future that it will return back to the IO loop. IO loop will call us back at the right point of time when the result is available, and we have the response here. Alternatively, of course, there may be no result. There may be timeout, there may be 404, whatever. Then it will be just normal Python exception handler, handling. So in this case, Tornado will just write 404 uh, HTTP error. That's it. You catch it with normal try except. Then we write response back to the user as uh, pretty common for Python web frameworks. And then we need to call self.finish because this is a coroutine, so we want to keep control when a request is cut. This is a full example. Let's say that we want to make the HTTP proxy. We, we want to pass a URL as a parameter, and we want a Tornado with a SyncIO to fetch it for us and just uh, stream it back to the client. So these are all of the required imports. There are not that much, actually. This you have already seen, the way that we construct request handler. Then we just get the URL argument from get parameters. We again create the async HTTP client. We fetch this URL, yield the future to the IO loop, get the response back, write response, finish response. Yep, please. Very well. So I repeat the question. Uh, the question is, uh, how exactly does it work over here that HTTP clients would normally block when you call the fetch, wait for the resource to be fetched, and uh, yeah, wh what is this yield from doing in this place? Uh, wh how does the asynchronous magic work? Very good. So this is a kind of a spatial HTTP client. 
async HTTP client, obviously. So we have a similar uh, library called just HTTP client in Tornado, and it will do exactly this thing. If you run HTTP client.fetch, it would block, it would wait, just like request, just like URL lib. It would block and wait and fetch the response. Async HTTP client is not blocking, it's not waiting, it quickly constructs a future object. So not the real response object, a future object, and returns that. And since we do not need to wait for a long time to just build a future, it's basically just creating an object of a class, uh, this happens super fast. And then we are yielding this future, so we're, so to say, sending it out of the function, back to the uh, IO loop that is controlling this whole process. Meanwhile, yes, this get request will just pause. So it's like frozen in this state until we have the response of the fetch thing. But we have other clients meanwhile. So IO loop will, in the meanwhile, it will serve other connections for us. Therefore, this get handler will be paused, but others get service. And in practice, it happens so fast that you never see it. And whenever IO loop will notice that, okay, now the, uh, the URL is fetched, now we have data on our socket, it will look up, okay, who have been waiting for it? Oh, it was this proxy get thingy. And it will call it back. And by calling it back, it will uh, have the result that was fetched, and it will push it just over here. So you can imagine that after the IO loop was done with fetching stuff, imagine that yield from was gone, it was never there. There was just the fetch operation. This is basically, in a glance, how that will work. Yeah, please. Uh, since it's stopping anyway on the yield from, uh, why do you need a future object? Why do I need what? Sorry? A, a future object. Future. Okay, so why do we need a future object here? So, uh, first of all, yield from. Uh, well, there was always yield without a from. Uh, yield from is required if we want to get futures from another coroutine. In this case, we don't have to use yield from, we can also use just yield. But if you're building a big system, you might have a stack of the coroutines, one calling, each other, one calling another, then you need from. But this is, I guess, not the question. The question is, why do we need a future at all at this point? So we need a future because if we return after the fetch call, if we will return the result, we obviously need to wait for results here. So basically, this call will block. So since fetching takes long time, we construct a future. And constructing a future does not take long time because it's just creating of a future object without waiting. This is basically how we use futures. It's kind of abstraction that uh, lets us not wait for the response, but give something back so that caller has a reference to the response that will come at the later point of time. And if you might find confusing this yield from syntax, you can also uh, imagine a raw future. So if we take back, take away yield from, just get the future and doesn't, don't call it response, call it just future. Take the yield from away. Then at the later point of time to get the response, oh. oops, I broke it. So to, to get the uh, response of this thing at uh, the later point of time, we can just call the uh, future.result directly. And uh, then it will give you the result if it's ready. So future is pretty simple. It has uh, a status, it has a result, it has an error, I guess. So you can access uh, the result directly. But it's just nicer if you don't do it and you let the IO loop do it because then you can use the magic yield from syntax that uh, will extract the result out of the future for you. Does it mean that accessing the results have to be used immediately after calling it will block? Uh, no, there will be no result, I guess. You can also check if result is available. So if you want to write a really bad code, you can write a loop in which you would ask, is the result there? No. Is the result there? No. And then you will reinvent the IO loop, because basically that, that's what it's responsible for. OK. Uh, we had this example as far as I know, so let's go further. Demo. I have the IPython notebook for you to uh, show this thing running. Uh, 
uh, let's agree on the simple case that we are going to test. So we have the client. That will be our IPython notebook. We have a web server. This will be the whatever asynchronous framework we are testing. And then we have three APIs. These three APIs will be requested in parallel, and uh, so asynchronously. And uh, we want to check how well web server is handling these three concurrent uh, requests to the third party APIs. To simulate this whole thing without external dependencies, I have everything running on my laptop. I have Tornado server or other framework server too, and I have a dummy local server that just waits for a fixed timeout of 10 milliseconds on every request and returns a dummy hello world greeting. And you can see it over here. So this is what my dummy local server does. Now we can test how fast uh, can IPython notebook fetch this dummy server response directly so that we have something to compare to. So it's 16 milliseconds. From these 16 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds is our fixed delay that we have on purpose, and six milliseconds for fetching overhead. So first example, we have just a blocking server. Just a blocking Tornado server that is using HTTP client, not async HTTP client, therefore it does not return futures, it blocks and it waits for results. In this list comprehension, I have three URLs, so three dummy URLs, that uh, I want to fetch. I'm calling fetch on each of them, and then I'm just uh, looping over responses and writing it back to the user. This is how it will work. So we request it uh, three times, same URL. We have the response. Let's see how fast does it go. Okay, so this is 54 milliseconds altogether. Obviously, we just multiply this 16 by three because it's a blocking server, so it did it sequentially. Now let's see how the same thing, but just using the async HTTP client work. Basically, what do we need to do to convert blocking code to non-blocking code? We need to change the HTTP client into async HTTP client, so add this thing. Then we need to mark it as a core routine in order to let a Tornado or other framework in uh, uh, async AO, it would be also a core routine, the creator. Uh, we let it know that uh, this thing that is uh, beneath will yield us back the future, so that Tornado knows to process it accordingly. So we are calling this thing, we have the same response, and this should be three times faster. It's not, because of the overhead, of course, this whole thing, IO loop and stuff, has own overhead, but it's 22 milliseconds. So comparing to 54, it's two and a half times less, more or less, and comparing to the requesting, uh, dummy URL directly, 16 versus 22. We have again about five milliseconds of the overhead of Tornado. Now the fun part comes. Node.js. So this is also a synchronous framework and probably everyone has already seen on the internet some article like, hey, my Node.js on the EC2 micro instance is handling, I don't know, 10, uh, hundred thousand of connections simultaneously. Yes, this is true, this does work especially in the case of WebSockets, it is a perfect case for a synchronous framework to be used because for WebSockets we have many connections, but all of them are mostly idling. So we are wasting our CPU if we have resources dedicated to each of these connections. We want uh, to use our resources efficiently. Therefore, at one point of time, we can have just one uh, client getting real work done on the back end. Others can just wait because WebSockets do not need everyone to do stuff at the same time. So this is how it works. Uh, I might, of course, have it not, the, not in the perfect way, as some JavaScript guru would advise me, but I did it on purpose because I tried to avoid external dependencies. Uh, Node.js has a lot of external libraries that would make it kind of look nicer, but this is just pure Node thingy. So what we do here? Uh, I created the option uh, object that uh, keeps reference to the local uh, to the local host dummy URL. I have uh, uh, the array that is uh, waiting for responses that will get the responses. Then I need to loop. I'm looping over API count, which is three, just to have three requests. 
and I do http.get. So http is a library that is kind of the uh, async HTTP client in Tornado. And then I need to, of course, define a callback, what to do after we fetch stuff. And I'm defining it in line in the best tradition of the JavaScript. Need to set encoding, I need to create the body chunks because this function will be called not when the result is ready, but when the chunk arrives. So on the data, I'm creating another inline function that will push this chunk to the array of chunks. Then on the end event that will send us after all chunks are there, I need to glue it back together by using buffer concat. Then I push responses to the body uh, object. And finally, when I see that, okay, so responses are three, just as API counts that was three, I can say, okay, everything is ready now. Uh, then I create the response text, I set headers, and that's it. I end the request. At the end, we have the same thing, and let's see how fast this works. We can remind what was in Tornado meanwhile, so it was 22 milliseconds for Tornado, and it's 18 for Node.js. Bravo, Node.js. Well done. We have three milliseconds faster, but maybe four hours more of our developer work. <laughs> Let's have another example. Scala. Wonderful, performant language. I guys just don't have time to go through all of this mess. Believe me, you don't want to read it. I, of course, realize that the people who are experts in Scala do this pretty fast. In fact, I was not the guy who wrote this, because on every conference when I'm showing some Tornado examples, I ask someone who knows some other asynchronous framework to give me the example so that I can uh, add it into my comparison. But the funny thing is that this thing is damn performant. Let's see. How in practice does it work? 22 of Tornado, 18, 19, slightly more than not, okay. But of course, this is not a very fair comparison because I have a fixed number of uh, uh, backend uh, APIs, which is three. So I fetch three APIs. What if we have 10? What if we have 20? We don't need to speculate. I wrote a little benchmark that will answer us this question. So here, I have Tornado, I have Node.js, and I have Finagle. And I'm going to increase the number of concurrent requests from 1 to 20. Then I'm going to plot a graph that will uh, show us uh, how do these different frameworks behave on the increasing load, so on the increasing of the concurrent request. And now it's ready. So here you see, Tornado was losing at the beginning, but it is quite stable at least. We see the total opposite question with Node.js because somehow at five requests, it just blocks and jumps up. And in case of Scala and Finagle, it's perfect. Okay, I have nothing to add here. Bravo to Scala. Tornado also did a good job. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, I might just have not a perfect configuration for Node because we obviously see this pattern of uh, jumping on every five uh, parallel requests added. So I think that yeah, we can stop at this point. Let me then jump back to my slides. This is the end. I will be open for my questions in a second. Just before I finish this, I want to remind you once again that if you want to do this cool stuff, have time for experiments and so on, you should maybe go to scooby.de or scooby.es and check for the jobs. Then I will be happy to uh, pass my presentation over to somebody else, continue with this research, have some different topic. So guys, check it again, scooby.de slash jobs, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> now questions. Thank Hi. you for the talk. Um, I was interested in, since async IO and Tornado have very similar uh, jobs, uh, what is the relevance of doing Tornado on top of uh, async IO instead of just using async IO? Okay, good question. So uh, why do we need Tornado on top of async IO at all? 
So I think IO does have uh, higher level libraries too. It's not only the IO loop and futures, it also has uh, tools developed specifically for I think IO already. That is uh, I think IO HTTP client, I think. At least uh, some uh, database drivers that are ready. But uh, Tornado is a web framework. So you can imagine Tornado as a subset of Django. It gives you templates. It gives you base class for request handlers. Gives you basic security stuff like CSRF protection and so on. Cookie handling and stuff. And I think I, I can go back to that uh, slide where I had a stack. Yeah? Oh. Okay. Uh, yes, here, thank you. So Tornado is just a higher level. It's application level framework that lets you build the web applications faster. Can be synchronous, can be asynchronous. Asynchronous is just one of the options that you would use Tornado. Most likely you will do it because you can, but you don't have to. And AsyncIO is a common uh, middleware, so to say, between higher level frameworks like Tornado or Twisted and lower level operating system selectors like QQ or EPOL or Select on Windows. Uh, so this is kind of a lower level set of tools. And yes, you can use it too directly without Tornado, but then you will need to build the rest of the web stack yourself. And this is something that you would normally want to avoid. Or just mm -hmm. use IO HTTP, say. Yeah, exactly. You can also call uh, the low level stuff directly. Okay, next question. Um, I have a question. Yeah, I'm not really um, familiar um, with this framework. Uh, so my question is, uh, is there a built-in ORM? If answer is no, is there is ORM of choice, like preferred one, or the one that you use? And then third, and the actual question is that, how does uh, async uh, stuff works with ORMs? Okay, very good. So first, uh, do we have the ORM in Tornado? No. Uh, Follow-up question, what would be the ORM of the preference? Uh, well, guys, I was working with Django for quite some time, and uh, I loved the simplicity, but uh, I've also seen attempts to put uh, SQL Alchemy on top of the Django that worked pretty fine. So I think that SQL Alchemy is kind of the standard ORM for Python in general, and uh, this is also our choice uh, to, be, to use that in Tornado 2. Uh, there is nothing special into connecting Tornado to SQL Alchemy. It's just two totally different things that are easy to use together, but you don't have to use them together. In fact, in some websites, you don't need database at all. So actually, not having overhead of ORM is even better sometimes. But if you like to have a database, you like to build a traditional uh, website, three-tire setup, I would recommend you to use Alchemy. It's pretty flexible and nice. Uh, but generally, you're not limited by that. You can use any ORM that you like. Uh, there was, I think, the second, another part. How does it work with a sync thing? Yes. So I also answer that. Uh, you are very right in asking this question because having uh, a synchronous uh, execution on the web server level does not guarantee us uh, success. Obviously, if something that we are uh, uh, waiting for, like a database or a cache, does not support a synchronous request. We can fix this problem by having a thread pool and use a thread pool executor, which is asynchronous in Python. But this is not cool, obviously, because we end up with a thread pool, and that is what we wanted to avoid in the first place. But now, uh, with uh, uh, asyncIO, we are having more and more tools that get support. For instance, for the database, you most likely like Postgres, because everyone likes Postgres. We have PsychoPG2 drivers that support the synchronous mode. For Redis, we also have the asynchronous driver. For Mongo, we have PyMongo, I think. So most of the tools are already covered, but not all of them. So you need to, to really look. But now, since we have this common interface, I think your thingy, they will grow, that's for sure. All right, uh, we are unfortunately out of time. But let's okay. give a big hand to Anton for his presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Write a synchronous code.